my name is David Oyuke, and um, my background, a little bit of that, is in media for the last 10 years, as a broadcaster, as a presenter. Uh, for more than two decades, I've also been a, a poet. I'm a published author as well, and I engage in conversations like these. Not as formally or in beautiful places like the book bunk, but it's very important to have conversations like this, and again, enabling us to have these conversations. So, without further ado, I want to introduce my panel. And I like the fact that it's two ladies, two gentlemen. I don't think that was deliberate, but if it was, <laughs> it's working. Um, I will start with the gentleman on my right. He goes by the name of Stoneface Bomba. Nimesma Bomba po? Amandi Bomba. Bomba. Stoneface Bomba. Uh, he's a community organizer at the Madari Social Justice Center, where he runs the MSJC Kids Club and Art for Social Change. He's also a member of the Madari Green Movement, a group of volunteers who, through planting trees throughout the informal settlement, practice collective imagination and action. Stoneface has spent time helping young people in Madari understand the systemic violence that shapes their lives. And his podcast, Until Everyone is Free, is an extension of that work. A round of applause for our first panelist, please. And to my left, we have Sitawa Namwalie. Sitawa Namwalie is an award-winning Kenyan poet, playwright, and performing artist known for her unique, dramatized poetry performances which combine poetry and classical Kenyan music. Cut Off My Tongue, her first performance, was performed in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and at the Hay Festival in the UK in 2009. In 2010, Cut Off My Tongue was selected by the Sundance Theatre Lab on Manda Island. And um, your growing body of work, now let me start referring to you personally. Your growing body of work includes short stories, Dramatized poetry productions and plays. You have one called Homecoming from 2010. Silence is a Woman, 2014. Black Maria on Koinanga Street. And Room of Lost Names from 2015. Taking My Father Home, 2020. And Escape the Musical. With all these, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask myself if there's one you've done before you got here. And I <laughs> Sitao Namwale is a fellow of the Talbag Foundation and lives in Nairobi and works as an international consultant. She holds a BSc in Botany and Zoology from the University of Nairobi and a Master of Arts in Environmental Studies from Clark University, Massachusetts, USA. Sitao represented Kenya in tennis and hockey in her youth. She's an award-winning athlete as well. A round of applause for Sitao Namwalie. <laughs> On our farthest right, we have Wangoi Wakamonji. Have I said it correctly? Tutajaribu. Tutajaribu tu. Wangoi is a regeneration practitioner, a retriever and bearer of new life, a weaver of magic, a honey jar carrier, a midwife of sovereign beings for the co-creation of generative just worlds, and an inviter and facilitator through passageways to life. That's heavy. She researches and translates indigenous African knowledges and practices into experiential processes, art and honey, to provide embodied tools for our people to heal from colonial traumas of past, present, and recreate ways to live regeneratively with themselves, Earth, and ancestors once again. And for us to decolonize and re-indigenize. Her work is motivated by the twin challenge of healing and creation of new realities for the present and future of the African continent. She explores this through research using academic and indigenous methods, storytelling in written and oral forms, traditional African dance and movement practice, and facilitating spaces for critical consciousness and transformation. She rethinks current world systems and reimagines a thriving world for all so we can redesign life 
towards regeneration in partnership with human, earth, and unembodied spirit relations. She's based in Rongai, and you can find her at From the Roots on social media. What were Rongai? Now to engine our suburbs, Raklamali. Beginning my coffee for. I hope you didn't have visa problems. <laughs> and at the center of this panel is a gentleman that we might all know if we have been um, consuming newspapers and literatures of the like. He's a household name, and his name is Paul Kalemba, also known as Mado. Paul Kalemba, aka Mado, writes and illustrates the weekly column. It's a mad, mad world. A satirical look at society and politics. In the Saturday Standard under the pen name of Mado, it was created at the Daily Nation in 1989 as a simple humorous fact strip. He shifted to the Standard in 1992 where the column has grown into a popular full page feature. The column is widely read by a vast cross section of Kenyans. It also has an audience within the East Africa region, the diplomatic community, and a good following in the Kenyan diaspora. Now in its 33rd year, it's a mad, mad world has run continuously, uninterrupted, and is today one of the longest running full page features in a tabloid newspaper produced by the same writer or artist on the entire African continent. Kalemba was born in Nairobi in 1962, and is a self-trained artist. He's worked for various publications as a cartoonist and illustrator, including Coast Week in Mombasa, Viva, Men Only, Drum, and True Love, The Daily Nation, and The Standard. He has also illustrated features by leading writers such as the late satirist Wahome Mutai's Whispers and the respected surgeon Dr. Yusuf Dawood's Surgeon's Diary. He produced the action hero comic series Miguel Seder. Is it Sede? Miguel Sede? Miguel Seed. Sede. You know, he has a. You know? By Miguel Seed in the 1990s, published by the, Saturday, by the Sunday Standard. A book compilation, It's a Mad Mad World, 2007 to 2011. The Hot Years was published by Boonie Media in 2012. It was prepared at Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Study and Conference Center in Italy. His work appears in various other publications. And the artist has exhibited his work extensively and has been involved in the organization of several workshops and seminars jointly with other leading cartoonists in Nairobi as well. He's a founding member of Katuni, the East Africa's Cartoonist Society, and is a recipient of several pre prestigious awards. Kalemba is a widower with two daughters and a son. The eldest girl follows closely in her father's footsteps while her sister is pursuing law and their brother, ICT. A round of applause for our panelist, Mado. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this conversation that we are about to have, I would ask that you note down a few questions because we will have a short Q&A session after where you can personally ask the panelists to either expound on what they meant or if you have any question for them that their experience might help you better understand. First things first, I would like to ask and invite the lady who is a world-renowned athlete to start off our session reciting what she is famously known for, and that's your poetry. You have a poem that you would love to open for us this conversation with. Kindly go ahead and tell us the name of your lovely poem. Right, thank you very much, David. Um, thank you very much for being here, all of you. Um, the poem that I'm going to recite is called Say My Name and it was the sixth poem I ever wrote. Say My Name. What's in a name? A famous bard once asked. Is the name in the rose or the rose in the name? Where does the sweetness lie? I don't know the answer to that question, my friend. No philosopher am I. What I do know is my own name. What is my name? Star the third Namwalie. Shh. Listen for the magic unleash when I call it. 
catch the glimpse of the dancer stirring, feel the sway of sinuous gyrating, hear drumbeats from distant past when I call my name. Hmm. What is in a name? I ask you again, is it nothing but hubris? So is hubris nothing? Does dignity lie in a name? Those questions, they're deep. They're concealing. Me, I know my name. What is my name? Star the third Namwalie. Watch my step now firming, my shoulders squaring. My hips start rolling from the rhythm of feet dancing from the distant mists of time. I hear music when I call my name. What is in a name? Will you answer me at last? Does belonging lie in a name or does the name belong? Does freedom come with a name? Hmm. Let's ponder those questions long and hard, my friend. My name is me and I am my name. Call me my name. Star the third Namwalie. I feel the struggle seizing, the constant warring ebbing, calm returning. I feel love when I call my name. What is in a name? Let's look at this question afresh. Is the name creation or is creation the name? Does enchantment lie in a name? I know the answer to that question, my friend. Listen close and I will tell you. I am... I am... The third Namwalie. I am... Sitawa the third Namwalie. My name is a silent secret unfurling, a well of wild effervescence forming, a drink to refresh on a hot, dusty morning. My name will quench your longing. Say my name. Say my name. Say your name. Thank you. I guess we're this close to all being Sital the third Namwalia. <laughs> the government would have been so confused. <laughs> you started um, with a remarkable poem right there. A poem that looks to see people beyond um, vain existence, beyond the cycles of waking up, carrying out your day, living. Your poem tried to expose people to be people and people to have a name and an identity. The first question that I'd like to ask you is based on something similar to that. There's a piece that you wrote, an article that I read, and it was astounding. It's from a longhouse. And in it, you captured a few of your um, movements in and around this vast world, and you experienced something similar to the lack of a name in that you experienced people being limited and their existence being limited to certain beauty standards. And you mentioned something about the white gaze as well. This is to quote you. You say, the idea that certain African features are ugly seems to intensify the higher you go up the socioeconomic ladder on the continent. This is not surprising, as in Africa, typically, socioeconomic success correlates with greater exposure to westernization and globalization. As they become economically successful, Africans subscribe to the white gaze to define their world. Could you elaborate on that unusual disdain that you experienced? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for reading the article. You know when you're a writer, you write and then you hope somebody reads it. So I was really thrilled that he actually read it and he's quoting me. Um, and that, you know I'm a, I'm a performer, so I stand. I'm sorry. So. 
He's talking about uh, uh, my recent article, which was published last week, actually. It's called The Beauty of Africans. And it is um, uh, an article that I wrote because of the um, xenophobia in South Africa. You know, you look, I, you know, we are all global citizens now. And I look at what's going on in South Africa. Of course, we ha I have relatives there. And, and I wondered, why is it that they do that? Why is it that they're killing fellow Africans? And so I started to look and um, read up on, what, on, on some of the reasons and, and, um, and discovered that uh, both black South Africans and white South Africans hate other Africans, right? So they've got this incredible hatred for other Africans. And the hatred is so serious that they kill us, yeah? Um, and and what I, what, as I continue to read, I discovered that um, it is a product of, of do, you know that, do you know how many years that uh, 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 South Africa was colonized? She's my friend, so I'm going to ask her. I'm blank. <laughs> um, should it be more than 30 years? South, he, said, he said more than 30 years. South Africa was colonized 309 years, ordinary colonialism, and then another 50 years, apartheid. Okay? So imagine we were colonized uh, less than 100 years, right? And imagine the damage that has been done to them. And so I looked and, and I started to see, I, could, I could actually started to see the damage that one of the most important uh, tools, as Steve Biko, the South African, said, in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Unless I accept whatever I'm being told about myself, the negative things, I cannot accept my oppression. I must accept so that I can then be a tool for my oppressor. And this, is, this for me is what has happened. And everything, absolutely everything, becomes um, as I then service the, the oppressor with my everything. I, re I repute my knowledge. Definitely, how can I be beautiful? I don't have blonde hair and blue eyes, right? So um, that, that is something I saw. And it is also something that I have seen here. Yeah? Growing up, we had very similar um, uh, ideas. And we still have them. And, and some of the, the things I wrote about it is observations of you, you know, peop, my fellow citizens um, over the years. Yeah, so I just want to say that so that I can hand over. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think for me it was surprising. There's an experience that you mentioned, and um, for everyone here, I would suggest that after the panel session, you can ask her about the article or if there's a way that it can be shared, because it was tremendously profound how someone who you describe as looking almost like coming straight out of your village told you about the ugliness of Africans. And you were thinking, but you look like them. And she had no idea because for her, in her understanding, ugly is there. Beauty is here. I think that was, that was, that was very, very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you with a few individual questions. Stoneface Bomba. Bomba. There's something about your life that is very fascinating. You work very closely with the people of Madare. And Madare is a place in which Pio Gama Pinto worked very closely with the Mau Mau. All these years later, we're talking about one aspect of colonization being the destruction of literature, artifacts, memorabilia. Is there anything within Madare that is not just a reminder, but an establishment of the work of people like Pio Gama Pinto? And do the people within Madare know the work that Pio Gama Pinto was involved in decolonization? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, First, maybe I can start by start stating um, what was the work of Pyogama Pinto, what actually Pyogama Pinto was doing to, to help the, the people living in the informal settlement, and not only just people living in the informal settlement only, but Af Kenya at large. And 
maybe I can, I can go back to where I get the knowledge to understand who Pio Gamapinto was. Uh, I went to informal school in Madare, known as um, Genesis Immaculate High School Church Project Center Dakota. It's a long one. <laughs> but in school, we were never taught about the real history of Kenyans, you know. And there's a certain paragraph at maybe in history, in history books in high school, there's a place they just wrote about Piogama Pinto as athletic who won and some young man. But deep down they never never talked about Piogama Pinto in deeply. So the fact that I was still at the Madari Show Justice Center, this is a, I call it a, is a is a community university for me and I learn and I get a lot of knowledge from, from Madari Show Justice Center by uh, learning the the idea of people and how people communicate. Then I came across a book known as uh, Kenyan Sang Mata, written by um, Shiraz Durani. Uh, then I was so much shocked to find like there is a lot of work Piyogama Pinto did in the informal settlement, but that was never ever documented in our history book. And this is this is very uh, we lost a lot of content, even understanding our own hist historians. Inside Madari, there's a, a, a there's a road known as Mau Mau Road. When I was growing up, I just came to understand maybe it's just a name given to a road. But by reading this book, now I come to understand clearly that Madari was the headquarter of the Mau Mau, you know. And people like Pigama Pinto was just living next to Madari. This is Pangani, you know. Even Malcolm X came, or came and visited Pigama Pinto inside just Pangani. And then Pugama Pinto, this, in 1965, this is two years after Kenya got independent, it was the first assassination happened in Kenya. And there's no way, in, even in the media, being, we are being talked about this, we're being told about what happened to Pugama Pinto, you know. So Pugama Pinto was buried just next to Madari, this is City Park. And when I was young, I was told to go to City Park and feed, feed the monkey, you know. And, the state, even the, the uh, can say the state they never tell us to go and uh, pay a, a memorial visit to Pugama Pinto, you know, because the work he was doing, it was very radical work, organizing the Mau Mau within the informal settlement and also liberating the, the mind of the people, you know. Now, where we went lost is because we never get the, this documentation where actually the history of, of understanding, uh, like, I can quote to how Malcolm X, Mal, uh, Marcus Garvey talked about, a people, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without a root. And what they decided to do, because even I connect the struggle that people in informal settlement are undergoing, like the killings of young men, um, gender-based violences, you know, you, you mentioned all the challenges happening in the informal settlement, and everything there, it's connected to the system. It's a systematic problem, you know, killing of young man because this young man is having dreadlocks, you know, because this young man is jobless. We have I've documented like so many uh, cases of a police execution. Even I'm so tired of documenting it, you know. Other people documented it, but we're still going on with the same killings every now and then. Um, so like. Now we wanted to liberate the, the, uh, the mind of the people. Like, we decided like, to have kind of an archive that's telling the history of Madari, like having this documentation on our own. And we wanted to come up with an archive that showed the pictures of Madari in some years back, how Madari was. And in, in our imagination, like, we decided to, we came to under, I came to realize that the modern, the modern war is the brain, is the brain button. Like, Vita Kiakili is the, the Vita in Yetunafatu na Pigania. Now we started equipping the mind with, with, with the soft power tool. This is uh, doing the podcast that we're doing, doing the art for social change work. Now this is what Piogoma Pinto actually was doing by organizing, using, even he was, document, he was writing a, a kind of mumenyeri, if you come across like mumenyeri, a vernacular language like to liberate the, 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 uh, the uh, I mean the Kenyans, the Kikuyu people. And doing this podcast, now we came to give it um, in a Sheng language, the, the language that people understand best, people live in the informal settlement. Uh, now telling the history of Piogoma Pinto and then the uh, the legacy that he achieved. Please mpige my coffee. Like, nanta explain kwa nini.
by the time anacheki mseka huyu anaenda anachapa research yake he's going into the the streets he's trying to dig for history that should be in literature that should be in books it it begs a question about the deliberate nature of still entrenching colonial thinking even in our education systems kuna maleta za apio kama pinto zilichomwa when when his house was burning some letters about what he thought of kenya what he dreamed of kenya and i keep on asking myself how powerful would that be if we had a picture of pio gama's idea of kenya now you know and it brings me to that other question of decolonization and the fear of speaking up against authority um mado 1992 you did something that was brave <laughs> you and your publisher i believe it was pius nyamora you are the first ever to speak power to authority through cartoons by drawing a picture of the then president daniel arap moi as much as it was post colonial kenya there was still the trauma of what happens when you speak up against authority how did you navigate that to the point where you are still passionate about decolonization today and what was going through your mind in that moment you see we can go back many years into the 50s and so on the guys the so called nationalists who are fighting for the independence of this country actually were selfish people well a lot of a lot of them not like uh, uh, peel who actually wanted what the colonizer had once they achieved that once they got that in uh, back in 63 we've all we've all seen that they continued with what was there the laws uh, i think the first uh, the first person to be detained in this country was detained under uh, british laws that was never changed all the way up to uh, i think 1992 so during that period of time from 1963 to 1992 we were actually in the post kind of uh, colonial era where now there was the neo colonies being uh, our first president and the second one and that's why we've got the uh, what we know as uh, the second liberation is so called because uh, those first uh, how many years is that 63 to 92 uh, we yeah, are 29 years 29 30 years we were still trying to decolonize our minds so the laws that were there were the ones that also governed us within the media um, in those days uh, you produce something and the laws there's a whole set of laws there defamation um, public slander innuendo all that so by 1992 no kenyan daily newspaper will dare have uh, the then president moi uh, as a caricature that was out even if us cartoonists wanted to depict him as such it would not go past uh, the gatekeeping editor as it is so it took uh, paul sinyamor as you've mentioned he was editor publisher of uh, uh, a weekly known as society magazine Uh, which uh, came into being at the turn of the 1990s 1989 90 he is the only editor who had the guts you know to call me up and say okay look uh, madu can we do moi i was thrilled wow you mean we can do moi yeah my editors don't want me to touch this guy yes let's do moi so we did moi uh, it was published and remember again uh, for those who might not really remember recall this history society magazine had suffered the wrath of authorities the offices had been bombed uh, the editor pius and his wife were grabbed a number of times uh, shipped over to mombasa detained for several days and so on so this we were talking about an individual with quite uh, some guts and i told myself okay i'll do that so it was published society used to come out on a monday So when it did I depicted Moi uh, in an unfair kind of situation uh, against his opponents at the time Moi Kibaki Ogingo Odinga and uh, Matiba because he had everything he had the state machinery he had uh, the state radio 
we used to license, well, not really license, we used to hold public rallies without licenses, but uh, uh, kind of stopped the opposition from doing the same. That's why the opposition at that time used to do their rallies in, uh, in funerals. And now you can see it's now become a culture up to today. It started then. Now, this magazine came out, and Paus Nyamore did not go to his office that morning because he knew special branch was going to come for him. He didn't appear the whole day. Now, one remarkable thing is that they didn't come. That neither was I called at the standard where I was, neither did my, uh, my, uh, my editors at the standard tell me, why did you do that? You know, uh, I've been working on contract all these years. So my contract is that I can, I can do anything else, anywhere else, as long as it's not a tabloid, which goes into uh, direct uh, competition with uh, uh, the company that I work for. So they did not appear. So this was actually a catalyst of some sort, uh, some kind of opening. Because once that happened, and again, they did not go out in the streets to collect the magazine like they used to. There was also another uh, controversial magazine called Finance Magazine. And so many times it will come out and special branch will either buy it out or just collect the copies. And you know, uh, everybody almost went bust. So this did not occur, which meant that uh, Nyamor and I, and his editor then, uh, Njoka, 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 is now somewhere in the government. Uh, well, let's forget his name, he's called Njoka. The three of us were never targeted. So we told ourselves, okay, then these are opening. So we went now full blast. From that edition, it was every, every week we were on Moi. Until now, the newspapers felt that they were being left out. And they decided also to join the bandwagon. At the time, I'd, I'd left the Daily Nation, uh, and I was at the Standard. Gado, who took over from me at the, at the Nation, now convinces his, his editors, we can do this. So indeed, at the time, we are actually decolonized our minds, kind of. Those 29 years of, you can't touch the president, had been blown to bits. Now, let me quickly just say that today, depicting the president is a boring thing. I mean, anybody can do it. So what do we do? We really have to have some substance in it, strong content. You know, why are you, why are you depicting Uru Kenyatta? And anybody can draw him. Yeah? Uh, comedians are all over the stage and YouTube making fun of him. So it's, it's no longer big news. But so we've moved on. We've moved to the uh, second kind of uh, whatever um, stage where it's, we want these people to change themselves. Um, another round of applause for, for Mado. Um, I'm going to ask Wangoi another singular question, and then I'll open up to the panel to have um, discussions um, that are quite wide and broad, some current um, for the last two or three months ago, in light of the decolonization space, and others um, a bit earlier on. Well, Wangoi, you say that you are in the space of healing and regeneration. Um, Franz Fanon, um, a very famous name when it comes to decolonization, he struggles to separate violence from decolonization. And reading your bio, I was asking myself, you speak about healing, you speak about regeneration. What's, what's your take on decolonization violently, or violent means of decolonization as somebody who uses healing and regeneration, or is part of the healing fighting for decolonization? Thank you for the question. Um, I will start by saying maybe that it depends on what definition of decolonization we're holding here. Yeah? And if I use an example from history, the armed uh, struggle for independence, that is part of decolonization, and I like how people who work in the healing space also talk about like healing itself can be very violent. Um, it's not like smooth, easy. Like imagine if you're ripping off a bandage, even if you take it off as gently as possible, it will hurt. Um, and so I can un I can see like the aspects of violence that Franz Fanon speaks about and the the kind of necessity of it, I can see it in, that in those terms. But I would also add that it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with the armed struggle. And I think even within the armed struggle, the, the, 
little or much that I have, you know, had to research on my own as um, uh, Stoneface was saying, yeah, this is not taught in schools, yeah? So even within those elements of armed struggle, it wasn't just an armed struggle. They had a multifaceted um, strategy. And I think that is what we also need. Uh, maybe at this point, we have gone beyond the point of um, requiring armed struggle. I think we can also try, and I think armed struggle maybe gets to like, when it gets to this is your final, um, like there's no other choice, yeah? You've tried other means, and then that is like your last, your last port of call, but you don't let go of all the other nonviolent ways of struggling. Um, yeah, I guess I, I will leave it at that. Thank you for that, thank you for that. So I wanna ask a question to all of us in the panel, and you can be free to answer. I'm not gonna pick and choose. But is decolonization simply a replacement of the imperial with the native? Or must there be a restoration of the humanity of the native and, to, and for that to be a priority in all the spheres of the native's life? Is that what we can and should call decolonization? I know Madhu had touched on that in our post-colonial Kenya where it was simply a replacement. Who had this office? Rusham Tu Kondani. Who owned this? Rusham Tundani. Let them take those positions. And it was termed that we're now rid of coloniality. So is it really just a replacement of the imperial with the native? Or is it about the restitution of the humanity of the native? Who would like to go first? Wow, okay, that was a long one. I didn't know my memory, is, uh, my memory span is two seconds or something like that. Well, okay, let me just uh, chip this in. Um, you know, to me, uh, there's uh, what I'll call a strong culture, not a superior culture, a culture that is stronger than another one, which I also will not say is uh, actually weak as such, but it just happens that this culture is stronger than, than this other one. And the stronger one will, uh, in most cases, or in most cases in the past a thousand years and so, overwhelm this other one. It does happen. It has happened. That's why we are where we are right now, and grappling with, uh, with, with, the, with our topic, really. Um, countries such as India, if I may just quickly make that reference, when the British arrived there, uh, the Indian was like, okay, you want to build uh, railways? Fine, go ahead. But there are things you are not going to touch. You're not going to touch our culture, our food, our music, our dress, you know, all that. But now other parts of the world, when the same Britain landed there, they just took over everything, completely. That actually the, the weaker, let me, let me call, it, call it the weaker uh, culture, um, started looking at its own aspects of, of its own culture and traditions as inferior and kind of started running away from that, you know. We, regrettably, are actually grappling with that in this country. Now, to get out of that, since it took uh, maybe 100 years, maybe 150 years, maybe 200 years, you mentioned apartheid was around for 300 years, it, it's quite a long while. Now, to move away from that mindset is not going to take, it's not overnight. In fact, uh, efforts such as these ones, which we shall support tremendously, and others, over time, probably, uh, I'll give it some 50 years at, uh, at, uh, at the quickest, probably more, but I'll, I remain a very hopeful guy that it can be done even quicker. But now to achieve this, obviously, we have to have uh, specific government policies in place. The government itself and those leaders have to be very passionate about that. They have to believe in it, you know, rather than just seeking office in order to uh, enrich themselves. So, if these guys will learn to recognize what, to me, I call the backbone of any society or not, culture and the arts, and sports, those three are key to any society's uh, success. When you travel outside there, you can see that it's all over the place. The statues, the museums, everything, and you're constantly being reminded about the past. Some people would say that, well, the past is gone. Uh, we are done with that, but this is not true, because tomorrow, it's not possible without yesterday. 
Yes, and yesterday you must be respected. So the mistakes that we made yesterday, the achievements that we, that we did, will reflect upon our, our future. So um, if I've not lost myself, where we are is we must, all of us, get into this. Government policies and us, ourselves. That we, we, we have to really dig deep in, inside ourselves and get that passion mm. to tell our history, to love it, to love our uh, traditions and culture and everything. And we shall be on the right path. Mm. In a minute, um, one minute, one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, <clears throat> thank, you very, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to take, because you asked a, a question which is very broad. Um, and so what I want to do is to bring it down to a specific thing, language. Yeah? Um, so, you know, the colonial project was not a polite, nice thing, right? So it was, it was not. It was, um, it was violent, and one of the things that it wanted and still wants is our resources. Um, and if we also look at an other countries, I think, what, for me, one of the most important things to do is to compare Kenya you know, we, we, we don't stay a silo, but also look at some, somewhere else. So if we look at language, um, we all know even today, and, and um, he's absolutely right, it's, a, it's important for all of us to be in, engaged in this project. Um, we all know that you are not allowed, and still in some s s schools, you're not allowed to speak your own language. And, and they, there's things that they do to you, isn't it? They, you know, they put you in a sack, they call you, they do things to you. Teachers today do that, right? And so he's, he's right about the, we know better, but we're still, we're still fulfilling the colonial project. In, in, um, in, in the Americas, um, it is much more violent. It was, it was much more violent. That when, when you spoke your language, you didn't just, be, you weren't just put in a corner and put a, a sack and, and called names. They actually hammered a nail into your tongue. You're never going to, you're going to remember that, aren't you? Right? So they hammered a nail into your tongue. And right now, if you look at the media, there's a lot of stories coming out in, about the, um, the, the schools in which the uh, local people, indigenous people were, whose children were just abducted and then taken to these schools by the churches, the Catholic Church, except particularly the Catholic Church, and then so many of them died. Right? So... I don't want us to, Im to, to imagine that it was a nice little project. Um, they taught us to, bring, to, to, to drink tea. They brought tablecloths and football. No. <laughs> um, and, and it's easy for us to imagine that, right? Because we are, you, you know, you look around, we're the majority. And, and we have this, this strange thing that we do where um, we, 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 we start to apologize for the colonialist violence but we, but, we do, but we recognize we don't do that for each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we start hating on each other, but we apologize. Oh, no, the, you know, the Mzungos are nice. They weren't really that bad, right? And yet, and yet we know, and many of us have relatives who really suffered at the hands of, 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 of the colonialists. So it's important, to, the reason I'm saying this is to understand the job that we have. And um, as Mado has said, it's not a generational job, right? Um, and one of the things you said is talked about stages. So, the, you know, there are various stages that we've gone through, including fighting for independence, right? And then getting the independence. And then our leaders stepping into the shoes instead of taking us to the promised land. You know, this canon is never arriving. So they got, you know, took the, all the benefits of, of the white, a white man for themselves. And, and, um, and now we had to fight them and we continue, right? So it isn't, it isn't something that I can say it's going to take 10 years or 50 years or, or 500 years. But it is stages of, and you can see the progress. So just a quick one that, as I finish, when I, when I was growing up, um, my father, my late father would talk about, you know the yellow fever tree? It's even called the yellow fever tree, the yellow acacia. The one with the, with, the, with the yellow bark, right? It was a bad tree. He called the, it was called the yellow fever tree. Now, he's, he's sent me to a very expensive, paid for a very expensive education so that I'm an environmentalist. And I've come back with this knowledge. And I'm like, 
no, those are good trees. He says, no, they're bad trees. We cut them down. Because Mkoloni said, to, said, that's where malaria comes from. Okay? So that's where malaria... And, he, and you couldn't... Despite his, my, my the, the, the money he paid for my education, I couldn't get him to change his mind. Right? But I have a different perspective. My child will have a different perspective. And we are, we're building this generationally. That's what I wanted to say. Thank, thank you so much for that. One going? Okay, I'll keep it short. I, I mentioned earlier about like what definitions of uh, decolonization we hold. So um, in short, no, it's not just like, a, you know, the white man has gone, we take over, we step into those shoes. No, that the violence that we have received from colonialism, that translates into trauma that lives in, in our bodies, it lives in our hearts, it lives in our spirits. We need to actually heal that in order to, to do different. Because if you just step right in, you're going to continue in the same train, in, in the same philosophy, in the same thought process, in the same idea of why are we even in existence? Why are we living? Now you've, you've boarded that train, and so you'll keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, decolonization, the, the uh, definition that I use is that it involves a restoration, a return of indigenous territory and life. And I like to use the word territories, a, a definition that I'm borrowing from some scholars. They use land, but I prefer to use territory because I think territory involves more than just physical territory. It's also our discursive territory. It's our emotional territory. It's our embodied territory, the territory of our own bodies, which is where that colonialism has, once it was t um, taken on, once our four forebears suffered it, then they passed it on in, in you know, like these examples. And even when we, in, in the future generations, in the following generations, don't have the historical context, it still plays out. It plays out in the violence that we see and plays out like the example in South Africa. And I love that the practice that you talked about, about like seeing and, and staying with that issue to really see it at its roots, that it's not just um, South Africans are awful, they, they prefer to kill Africans. No, it's that they are wounded. And that wounded, that violence will translate into more violence until we stop it, mm -hmm. until we actually heal, until we pause and are able to sit in it and actually feel through it. And that's an embodied process. That's a heart process. It's not just about the mind. And I think, you know, if we say 50 years, we've been decolonizing the mind for 50 years and actually a bit more. That's when that book was published. But we're still suffering the same things. It's time we also get to our bodies and we get to our hearts, we get to our spirits. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask a question because you actually prompted something that I wanted to talk about, and that's language. Uh, I wanted to discuss language on two fronts. One, there's a school of thought that says all you have to do is to get to Luga Yamta, eh? You don't put your freedom yet to get Kiswaili, Kilam Tacha Konga Kizungu Zungu Apa, to Chapetu Kiswaili, and it'll give us a sense of identity back. But we forget some home guards spoke Kiswaili. So it can't just be as simple as speaking Kiswahili. Some of the people who betrayed the Mau Mau spoke local languages. So it can't just be as simple as speaking local languages. So how can we use language to actually help in decolonization on one front? And on the second front, I'll talk about language as a means of accountability. Because that's something that I noticed from a Kenyan artifact being stolen that I will tell you about shortly. But first and foremost, is it as simple as changing your language to get back your sense of identity and speaking your local language? Stoneface, to kichapiana tuwa pevi mazea ni tuchapiana tu reba pevi amta tutakuwa free. Is it that simple, really? Kwa apa? Yeah. Ati tuchapiana tu luga amta, and then that that already elevates our identity and we don't feel as though we are under any coloniality yoke. Is, that, is it a, that simple as some people are trying to make it? Yes, and I feel like just communicating a local language within ourselves, things are very powerful. Mm. You know, like, that's why I ended up doing a uh, podcast on Sheng, mm. because it depends with the audience that I wanted to reach. Mm. These are the people who are in, oppressed in the informal settlement. The, the best language that they understand best is Sheng. Mm. Now, Singe come up, like mm. they won't understand of anything. They'll be like, any project plan. But whenever they feel like 
they could get in their shoes because I wanted them to liberate themselves. Now I started using the Sheng language, you know, like understanding our culture best. Now, back again, like to understand now, if come and get penda to me like the the official language, like Kizungu nini nini, inge kuwa very terrible sometimes, you know, like inge kuwa piena even the podcast itself, yes, it play, it just played in them. Never say the media because who owns the means of production? Mm. Who owns the media? You know the system, mm. and system itaki we wele kweli. You know, like they will. So the black, like the white, white Lord de la Mers, are replaced by the black Lord de la Mers. Now, as we said, they will betray the Maumau, and you know the tukianza kubonga of it. What will happen next? They will like me pinta ive me ko assassinated Amanda. So, like talking our own languages sometimes is very powerful. Mm. Yeah. But it goes beyond Kuonga to the same language. So, Sana in that designs are information, mm-hmm. education. Yes. See, Lazmati, oh, Sasa to Kuonga to the same language. Yes. Na ina no. Okay. Um, just to quote, I really absolutely agree. Um, Chinua Chabe once said, I think people were criticizing him for using English. And he said, yes, I use English, but I intend to do with it unheard of things. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a question of what are you intending to do? To, to fikir apo, what are you actually intending to do? And I actually think it is important to, to recover, reclaim our languages, because languages are one important archive of who we are as a people. And I will quote a friend of mine who says, you know, I'm from this community and it has both the liberatory um, side and it has the the side that is an oppressor side. I align myself with the liberatory side. Mm. And I think that's the thing we need to do with our own languages, to go back to what are the philosophies of life? What are the lang- what are the words that indicate life, value for life, value for each other, value for justice, value for peace? And those are the elements we align ourselves with. So it's really about the intention. Uh, may I just add sure. just, yeah. one, just one line? You know, uh, I think we also have to admit that there are areas or aspects of what we inherited from the colonizer that we must keep, that we cannot run away from. Uh, if we have to be part of the international community, uh, just quickly, China has got how many, 1.4 billion people or something like that. And I think the, uh, the largest language spoken on earth is Mandarin. Mm. Isn't it? It's Mandarin, isn't it? It beats English. But for that Mandarin uh, individual joining aviation to fly out of China, the, he or she must learn the English language, which is the language of aviation. So there, there are these things that we must accept and, then, and, and move on. Uh, the colonizer used some of us for his own benefit. That's why the Swahili speaking home guards were, were cracking the heads of, of their Swahili speaking village mates. Yeah. So at this point right now, then we must use the colonizer's language to decolonize ourselves. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I'm being clear about that. Mm-hmm. We cannot run away from the English language, for example. Uh, David and Stoneface here, right now, you are doing very nice sharing. Then suddenly you went back to English. Yeah. <laughs> you just did what you do with your caricatures in this one moment. <laughs> um, I want to talk about um, the language of accountability. And it's because I saw something quite interesting about the language that was used. Um, there's a Kenyan stolen artifact. It's a musical instrument. And I know that uh, Mado, you work very closely with Kitabo. Um, that is involved in not just music production, but also musical history. And there's a drum from the Pocomo that was stolen and is still in the British Museum, I believe, for more than 111 years. It's called the Ngadji. I don't know how to pronounce it. But the language that was used was very telling because they say that it was simply confiscated. And my thinking is, what can we do to make people use language of accountability? Because it's very easy to say it was confiscated. It got lost. We just found it and kept it for 111 years. As opposed to saying, yes, we plundered. Yes, we stole. What lack of power is there in not using the language of accountability. Who wants to go? 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, what, one of the exciting things that is happening is that this uh, conversation we're having, the decolonizing, at this level, right? So this, the, for me, this is the next level, which will take us to the next level, is happening all over the world and is happening in many places in this country. And one of the leaders um, in, in terms of returning our, our, our material culture are um, our, our, our friends in the nest, right? So they are negotiating, not as a government, but as, as just normal Kenyans have gone uh, to Germany and are negotiating with governments and telling them, you've got to return our, um, our, our material culture. Right, and that and and there, you know, so normal citizens are leading that move, and and um, it's being returned. Things are being returned, and um, there's an incredible uh, um, video with Chimamanda uh, again in Germany talking about material culture and just saying, "You guys stole our stuff. Give it back." So we are not waiting. I don't think you can wait for people to be accountable. People who have violated you, people who have taken things from you to be accountable, you have to force them to be accountable. And that force is being applied. That's a really good news, right? And it's producing incredible results. That's, that's brilliant to know, Tamado. Yeah. Um, as you've heard, I'm also associated with Ketable Music. It's a platform that researches archives, uh, music, music, East African music genres for preservation and posterity. Um, we've been at it for the past like 12 years and so on, and we've discovered actually plenty of stuff. Anyway, just, just quickly, yes, there are conversations to return some stuff from, if you've been to those uh, famous uh, museums in Berlin, there's actually uh, an, either an African section, or this museum is just Africa, you know, and full of stuff it's from Tanzania, from and the other places that they, Namibia, I think, um, and Britain. There are conversations to return this, but I don't know what language is being used. But I just wanted to refer, I wanted to just go back to the music bit and how much we can get back. And I remember there's a song, I don't know if, if it's the only old guys who will know this or younger people, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Mm. Da, 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 the Lion Sleeps Tonight. It's been done by Western pop groups, became very famous and rival. But nobody recalls that this song was actually recorded in 1939 by a South African called Solomon Linda, and it was called Mbube. When, uh, yes, Mbube, in, in Zulu. Uh, and when uh, uh, these guys from the West took it up, and that was it, it was gone. It was gone. How do we get it back? Mbube, sorry, uh, Solomon Linda, who, who recorded it, must have died somewhere maybe in the 1940s or whatever. Uh, can we comp compensate the family or whatever? Another song uh, that has been, is it appropriated? Yeah, culturally appropriated. Yes, that one. Like that one. That's what <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's Jambo Buana by The Mushrooms. Yes, that song. Now, The Mushrooms is a group I have known very well. Uh, his current leader, John Catano, we've had so many conversations about that. And indeed, they were taking legal action. And they, not only in this country, outside there. And they went several steps. Then one day I asked him, uh, so, Mefiki uh, Wapi, where have you reached? He does not want to discuss that. And it's understandable. Disneyland is not a kiosk. Those guys are worth billions of USDs, not Kenya, not, not Kenya shillings, yeah? And imagine this family, the, the Harrison family, yeah? John Katana, Harrison, and, and the rest, they all call, call Harrison, going against that corporation, it's, it's a uphill task as mm. it is. Well, I'm not running away from our going and demanding what we, what, what, what we believe is ours. There's that, it's a trickle, they're trickling back. I think Chief Somoei, uh, no relation to Ruto, <laughs> Chief Somoei, I think the British have agreed to return some artifacts. Uh, the Germans are returning some skulls that they got from... Belgium as well? Yeah, and Belgium as well. Yeah. Now, you know, okay, okay, just besides the point, why do Wazungus, why did they take those skulls? I mean, are they also a little weird, you know? <laughs> anyway, okay, right? <laughs> I'd yeah. love to just sure. add on a few points. Um, 
And yes. sorry, just, just before you continue, kindly remember um, that we will have a Q&A session. So I hope that you've been taking um, down a few questions to ask our panelists, uh, because uh, our time is really, really moving fast. I, I think we'll have to have a part two, part three, part four conversation of this. What do you think? I, I think it's quite an extensive conversation. And I think so many of us are invested in learning and growing and participating in this. So we will, we will we'll see what the book bank will do about that. Wangoi? Um, just quickly, I think yes to the pressure, and the pressure needs to be kept on. And yes to also recognizing that this might be one of the opportunities or, or avenues for actually getting resources to further wo the work of decolonization. Because it is true that we do need re resources, you know, to do this work, to do healing work, to do recreating work, to do history research, to do all of that, we need resources, yeah? Um, I think I'd, I'd like to try a, like a caricature move and say this, this song that you just talked about, Mbube, um, there's a group in South Africa called the, I believe, Amarioni Brothers, and they've done a version of it, and I love it because it says, the lion is angry, there's no more sleeping tonight. Hmm. And, and I love that that is a way of reclaiming that song for themselves, that no, 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 we are no longer sleeping. We are angry, we are waking up. Um, and I'd love to just, you know, offer, for example, if um, I think one of the points about many of the artifacts in museums are that they're not even on display. The room size, like the African room in the British Museum, is not that much bigger than this hall we are sitting in. And it does not have that much, that, that much of anything, really. Most of the things that they have taken from this continent are in the basement. They are locked up. Yeah. Nobody actually has access to them. They are rotting away. Nobody goes to check on them. Nobody looks at them. And for me, it's a question also of, okay, to remember that these artifacts had a function in their origin spaces and to ask, okay, if they were to come back, how would we receive them? And so to not only see that the work is over there, the work is also over here, that we need to create those spaces of actually revalorizing those artifacts, revalorizing the cultural um, aspects, the cultural rituals, the cultural practices that featured those artifacts. Not that they are just singular artifacts. We didn't have museums. All of these artifacts had real functions in our, in our spaces for our people, meant something. Can we actually work here as well to revitalize our cultures, to revitalize our beings, our spirits, our hearts, our bodies, so that when they come back, they're not coming back into emptiness, they're not coming back into a museum space that is sanitized, mm. that is also a way of the state technically stealing culture. Can they come back to communities that are vital? that are alive. Oh, that is powerful. Oh, I need a round of applause for that one. Uh, because of time and the fact that uh, we will need to have uh, several sessions of this conversation, which I would be so excited um, to, to hear, I'd like to move on to a Q&A. Um, I don't know if there's anybody in our audience who you have any question that you'd like to ask the panelist. At this moment, I would love to give you that opportunity. If you have one or two questions, um, I think that a microphone can be passed on to you. There's, a, there's, there's two hands right there. If we can pass a microphone to them. Yes. Do you have a microphone with you or can I? <laughs> no, there's one, there's one beside you. Um. I'll begin by saying that we are one. We are one is a slogan that I, am, I have been uh, greatly pushing. Sisindio, wow, wow, we are one. Change is necessary. It takes time and it is possible. There is no independence in Africa as long as we are divided by the borders that were drawn using rulers by colonial rulers. My name is Njoro and I am a spoken word artist in collaboration with a local uh, studio in Kikuyu called 902 Street. They have invited me to facilitate their poetry workshop. So my question is how exactly can I be able to um, have a session such as this in that workshop? Where we, because these are the, this is what we are discussing. Young people such as myself, very open-minded people, very... Um, enthusiastic people about change, how, how exactly can we benefit um, in a way? And uh, the title of the workshop is Looking Towards Tomorrow, 
today from yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that you will be put in touch with um, the organizers of um, this event because I'm sure that they're always looking to collaborate uh, to get to know people who are doing something similar because, it's, well, a rising tide lifts all ships, I'm paraphrasing. So um, I believe that will be done. Um, there's a microphone somewhere there because there's another question. I guess I'll stand. Hi, thank you so much for your thoughts. It's very interesting and really important to think about decolonization. Um, and I've just been thinking about what you're saying. And I think, um, I don't think we can talk about decolonization without talking about capitalism. Absolutely. And, you know, as much as we may do all this work, and it's very important to decolonize culture, to take back our languages and all this. But we're living in a time when capitalism is destroying all that we have. And you can't think of colonialism as proceeding without capitalism. Um, and we're, you know, was it Frederick Jameson who said, um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. So I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts about the relationship between overthrowing capitalism, if that's even something we can think about, because it seems so impossible the way in which just capitalist thinking has dominated, even the way we think, all the narratives around us, um, the media, everything we see around us is more and more entrenching the system. So I'm interested in what you think about the relationship between decolonization and removing capitalism. Um, because Bri uh, for myself, question. I'm not very optimistic. <laughs> brilliant question. Thank you so much. Um, who, who'd love to answer her question? That is a very difficult question, and it isn't. It's and, and I take it very seriously. It's not something that you just give a glib answer to, and um, I think all of us are engaged. Or um, the, fortunately, there are a lot of people engaged in uh, dealing with that particular question. Um, we have a system that is so dominant; it covers everything. We can't imagine ourselves out of it. We can't imagine something else. And and we are doing it anyway. And we are imagining. And we are creating. You know, I. I, I, um, and yeah, and it, 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 um, it generates, you know, it's a hungry beast that generates, um, you know, the current system and all the, um, uh, you know, inequalities, etc., uh, that feed it, right? So I, you know, understand that. Um, and I always, I always think of, um, uh, I always go back to my grandfather and my grandmother. And imagine it is 1942, and uh, all they know is this colonial beast that has dominated and has, you know, created this huge um, um, edifice of knowledge that just says this is this is the only way. And yet they got us independence. So I think what is important is for us to recognize it. The, the magnitude of the, of the beast that we're fighting, but, but to understand that everything has its own time. There's been many civilizations on this earth, many. This is not the first one. This, is, this one is only 300 years. Capitalism is only 300 years, actually, or 400 or something. It's, you know, in terms of the human, human existence, it's, it's, it's not that, that long, um, and it is a dominant one, and, and I, I, you know, the work we're doing, the, the work we're all doing, I think, is the one that's going to give us the answers. Thank you so much for, for that point and answer. Um, Wongoy? Yeah, I'd love to just add a little bit. Um, absolutely, I don't think colonialism can exist without capitalism. Um, and I cannot say that word, capitalism, so... Um, when I think about colonialism and, and like five features that define colonialism, the kind of key one is a core desire for accumulation. And that is what colonialism does. It eats up other worlds um, wherever it goes, yeah? And so when I think of like, okay, any colonialism, regeneration, decolonial, decoloniality, um, three levels at which that must live, live in, or actually does live in, it lives in our bodies, it lives in narratives like you were talking about, so narratives, media, language, stereotypes, all of those things, and it lives in like policies and structures and so on, that's like the huge beast, yeah? Um, I would propose uh, 
I love this proverb that I learned in high school. Actually, was useful for some things. So um, I think it's it might be a Luya proverb. That's what my assignment said it is. But it was given in English, and it was um, chewing on a locust leg while laying plans to hunt for the elephant's thigh. I'll say it again. Chewing yeah, on a ours. locust leg. Please, <laughs> please give me the real version. <laughs> Say oh, no. it in its appropriate form. <laughs> because I've been looking for it since form three or something. Um, chewing on a locust leg while laying plans to hand down the elephant's thigh. And I think that's a really guerrilla move. And I think that is what we are called to do in these times. Um, to liberate pockets of our lives, liberate pockets of our communities, while we lay down plans to together liberate the larger structures. Yeah. Uh, wow. Just one line. Sure, sure. Uh, may I add this? Again, information is very important and urgent. Information. And the spread of it. Yeah? Yeah? Information. Yeah? I'm a doodler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, capitalism benefits so much from information. And they'll beam it out. You will notice that uh, the so-called communist countries or socialists or whatever, tend to inhibit information. So that's something else. Now, capitalism is so happy about spreading it, and it actually adds to our own uh, misfortunes, as it is. We in Africa have been complaining so much for many years that the Western media is biased, biased, biased. Now for me, um, my view will be that, let's not complain, let's build our own. Let's build our own and beam it to the West. Whether it's consumed or not, let's just beam it to the, uh, give it throughout. Do not fight the BBC, CNN, or anybody. They are there. They are not going anywhere. But let's give them Africa News Network of some sort, and we shall be on the road to recovery. Uh, st Stoneface if... rain towards a microphone. Oh. <laughs> What's on your mind? Um, I think maybe to, to add on uh, my colleague here, what to say, like, I have to fade it, you know, like, first of all, we need to preach it deeply and deeply every now and then, uh, like how the, the religious does, like, hallelujah. Buenas if you Buenas if Let me assume this is pastor. Buenas if you As if you tena. Nilikuwa na pita hivi ni kapatana na rafiki yangu. Buenas if you were. Akanisalimia na kitambo sana. Buenas if you you know why, why are they, our necessities are sana kwa buwana sifiwe and we're responding amen? You know why? Because in a same way, kila wakati, kila wakati, until to meishika. Even if pastor is not talking of religion activity, but his own, so long as kuna hallelujah, we just respond, amen. Imekwek introduce you every now and then. That's, that's the way you can go. <laughs> Interesting. Um, is, is there any final question? Um, and again, just a reminder that these conversations don't end here. Um, you can always um, get in touch with the book bank, share your questions with them, because these are discussions that should not just be done on a panel conversation. Many more of us should be thinking about these things, thinking about them in our homes, thinking about them in our schools, having conversations in our neighborhoods. And you being here in this panel will contribute heavily towards that when you get to share these conversations and your feedback and your questions to the book bank and then we can disperse these questions. Um, last question. Ooh, I am so sorry. There's someone at the microphone already. Yes, kindly, kindly go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the fruitful discussion. So I have two questions, actually. One is uh, how efficient or sustainable are the policies change or the process of decolonization if we still depend on uh, finance, our budget, government budget donations, since it's kind of, there are conditions which come with it. That's one. Second question is uh, the concept of Ubuntu. She talks about the healing process of people, how effective it can be from the heart, and what's your take on that, the Ubuntu, Ubuntu part? Yeah. Who'd like to go? Um, sure. Uh, Wangoi? <laughs> Especially because the last one was mostly, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I was still sitting with the first one. <laughs>
and I think it's it's a challenge that I think we've we've touched on also here um, with the discussion about stepping into old shoes and and so on. Um, but I'll take the one on on Ubuntu. Um, I'll I'll give my answer in this way and and also give you a challenge. So. I think we all have, at this time that we're living in, a generational responsibility to not pass on as many of the harms and wounds and traumas that we have inherited from colonialism to the next generations. I think we have access to tools, to practices, to resources, to knowledge. We have the capacity. And I'd like to actually invite us to make that commitment, yeah? That it's not just, I had this today and then I go on with my life. What is your generational commitment to your descendants, to the people who look up to you, to the people who will be waiting on whatever you pass down? Um, for myself, I would rather not pass down any more generational curses. I would rather pass down generational gifts and this requires me to heal both my lineages as well as to cultivate the good that I want to pass on. Um, so my challenge is this. I think, uh, as Stoneface was pointing us to earlier, history is so important. It's so important for us to look at what we were not taught. And there's so many silences. I love how um, Yvonne Odiambo says, uh, in Kenya, silence is a third language. What are those silences in your family? What are those silences in our histories, in our schools, in our media? Can we unearth those silences? Can we commit to digging there? Um, in an article I've written, I've talked about history providing us or, or give, gifting us three things. I think history and really looking pre-colonial history gifts us agency, our agency back. It gifts us possibilities. You look back and see, oh, okay, so capitalism was not the only way. There can be other ways. Oh, okay, um, any social structure that is oppressive today, you can look back and think, oh, so it, this is not the only way. It can be different. Here are some possibilities of how it looked different. And I think what those two, three things do, agency possibilities, they liberate our imagination, that we can imagine differently. One of the tasks that I'd like to give everybody here is to look back into your cultures, whichever cultures you come from, and whichever cultures your parents come from, and find out what, is, what are the words, what are the languages that your people used to talk about what, it, what was the highest good they were working towards as a community. And I think that reorients us from a desire for just accumulation that eats up the whole world um, and our world is burning, and it reorients us to different desires. And once we reorient and commit to different desires, I think we can find our path out. And remember to not do this alone. You don't heal alone. You heal in community. Um, so Ubuntu, yes, but Ubuntu comes from a place, and it comes from a rooted proverb, Ubuntu ngumuntu gabantu. It means something to the people from whom it comes. What are those words? What are those phrases that your people used? And can we share them with each other so that we can orient to different desires? Some examples just from research that I've been doing, for example, for among the Kikuyu community, thayo, peace. What does it mean? And, and then it invites me to ask the question, what does it mean to orient my life the way I move through the world to a desire for peace. And not a like soft peace, a peace that has teeth, a peace that knows that justice is prerequisite for peace. And when I start to think that way, it means that I move differently. Uh, my heart is moved differently. What does it mean if I come to this panel? What, what, what does peace mean here? How does peace show up in my relationships, in my family, in my workplace, on the matatu? with the kange who will say something mean to me. You know, it begins to change how you actually live. And then you pass that on, and then you get in community and m live from those different desires, yeah? So that would be my offering and my challenge. Okay. Uh, la yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, because of time, unfortunately, we will have to um, postpone, I will not call it end, but to postpone this conversation. 
Um, if you do not mind, I will just appreciate another round of applause for the panelists. I think they've done remarkably well with the amount of time um, that we had to capture such an extensive conversation. And again, the invitation is continue having these conversations. If you can get in touch with the book bank, share your questions, share your, your observations, share your resources with them as well, whether it's articles, whether it's videos. Um, there's some interesting videos that you can also find about education systems changing in Kenya to involve mother tongue in schools. There's another video about NFT being used now as a way to kind of use decolonization, where they take pictures of the, the artifacts in museums and turn them into NFTs. So things about like that, where there's technological innovations and the like. Right now, we will be having a performance courtesy of Katable. So if you're ready to dance, if you're ready to jump, if you're ready to just move those feet, then there's a place that we can do all that, and it is right um, on this other side, where you'll enjoy great music, courtesy of Katable. And please, feel at library, engage with one another, um, meet new people, um, s strengthen your friendships if you already know a friend here. And again, thank you so much for your time, and let us transition to have a great time through the music of Katable. Thank you so much. My name is Wairi Monduba, and I am the founder of Veggie Kenya. Today's event is amazing. I'm enjoying it so far. Um, where I see Kenya in 10 years, that's a really hard question. Um, it's really stretching my imagination. I think it's my hope that we'll be at a place where equity and justice is, is the norm. Um, and yeah, I think right now, that's my hope. I don't know if that will be an actuality, but that's my hope. Hi, so my name is William, and uh, what I liked about the whole book bag events is, or the pile discussion which I just came from, was how, you know, some colonial legacies still persist up to this day. Um, I really liked what one of the speakers, um, I think her name is Sitawa Namwali, mentioned how some of those colonial narratives still persist to this day, given how, you know, and how they, they are disguised under the forms of um, their daily life. Like the, um, how she mentioned how schools kind of like trying to instill that thing about not speaking Sheng and how you know, colonialists use language as a way to kind of like subdue society and how those still persist to this day. So I think you know, it gives you a fresh perspective on um, how society is and still is because of what happened in the past. So yeah, I think what Bookbike is doing is really, really necessary and it still gives you a fresh perspective on how to look at, the, you know, how life is and I really can't wait to see what the Missing, what the missing Bits project does and how they go to like um, work with other libraries to actually restore the, the former glory because, you know, a lot of what is really, really important is being lost. So yeah, I really, yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, the next uh, series by Bookmark. Yeah. So um, I'm really excited to be here today. It's been an amazing event. So many great offerings, the exhibition, the audio recording, lots of history and, and lots of also just merging with technology, so being able to save the history, so that's really dope. Um, congratulations to Bookbank for being able to put this off. And my favorite part about today was the panel discussion, because they talked about um, healing and reclamation. That was really, really great for me. And I also got to learn about a, a female poet, Sitawa, which is amazing. So yeah, that was it for me. You? Um, again, I feel really excited to be here as well. I feel like it's a very refreshing experience to know that what we knew growing up is not what it was. It's not Fact. what it is. Fact. So <laughs> it feels really great to just be emancipated, you know? Uh, so it makes me feel like going back and just uh, taking my time to review history as not in the books, but from my relatives, how it used to be, from the people who were there when it was going on. So yeah, I'm so excited about everything that's going on, what Bookbank is doing. Keep it up, guys. And my favorite part of this day was, of course, the panel session. Um, my name is Kevin Onyancha, and so far, this event has been an eye-opening event. It's been amazing. 
first thing I entered, I saw something that was interesting. It caught my eye was the digitization of old photos. So I actually carried some of my old photos and I got them digitized. So I thought it's a really interesting initiative. One thing I've learned is that in order to move forward, you have to learn about your past. And uh, where do I see Kenya in the next 10 years? Um, well, some people say Nairobi, especially Nairobi, um, is the city to be. Um, great talents, the environment is amazing, you know, with all the improvements of infrastructure and technology. So, um, I think Kenya is the country to look out for, uh, in term, in, especially in Africa. Hi, my name is Mombi Kanyogo. Um, so today I spent a lot of time in the exhibition and what really stood out to me there was how uh, there was a lot of, like Kenya, Kenyans were very progressive and there was a lot of, a lot less censorship of each other and there's a way that if you just didn't know that you'd, you'd imagine that Kenyan culture has always been particularly conservative so it was very interesting to find out that that's not always been the case. Kenya in 10 years, I'm not very optimistic. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. I hope that there's more movements. I hope that there's more uh, community making amongst us to get through difficult conditions. I'm not sure about what the political scene will look like. I'm sure the economy will not be as, will be worse in fact, but I hope that there's serious movements and I hope there's more community making. Yeah, that's it. Hi, my name is Noah and I've had a really good time out here today. I think some of my favorite bits have been outside. It's been so interesting learning about what journalism looked like in the past, the kind of things and the kind of content you would be able to see on, like, on the newspapers and stuff. I don't think today you'd be able to see um, an article about women having a beer together in a positive sense in today's media. And I'm super excited to see more stuff. I can see that there's so much I haven't even unpacked yet. And yeah, I'm excited.